Last week, we entered into the book of 1 Samuel. And we did so finding this woman, Hannah, in a desperately sad situation. We've got to understand that in her world, a woman's worth was seen in terms of motherhood. Uh, Their identity was seen in almost having children. Uh, But as verse 2 of the opening chapter tells us, Hannah had no children. Uh, In fact, she was unable to have children. And to add to that pain, her husband's second wife, who clearly has no problem in having children, uh, she jumps on the opportunity to tease and to bully Hannah, uh, belittling her for her barrenness. And then we saw not even Hannah's husband, the person closest to her in all the world, Elkanah, He didn't even really understand or get her situation. He appears to be a a, a relatively kind man, but he's clueless. He is comfortless. So at all these levels, Hannah is suffering. But this evening, we're going to see that in the midst of her suffering, Hannah gives us a powerful example of faith. She doesn't wallow in self-pity. She doesn't spiral into a bitter rage. Essentially, she doesn't give up on God. If anything, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. We're going to see this evening Hannah giving her all to God. Hannah holding nothing back from the Lord. So, one of the most heroic figures in Scripture isn't known for slaying a giant or for surviving the lion's den. Rather, it's a relatively obscure woman weighed down with multiple burdens coming to the Lord in prayer. And in faith, she casts her burden upon the Lord, knowing that he cares for her. And she believes her broken heart matters to the Lord. And in all of this, she teaches us so much about prayer. And as we look at her prayer this evening, we want to just highlight four qualities, four characteristics of Hannah's prayer that, that stand out for us. And we'll take them as we, as we go through the passage one by one. Firstly, the true freedom of prayer. The true freedom of prayer. Verses 9 to 16 of that opening chapter. Hannah's first port of call in her situation is to go to the Lord. Verse 9 and 10, it tells us, she rose and prayed to the Lord. She goes straight to the Lord in prayer. And affliction will do this, won't it? It drives us. It moves us to prayer. Uh, Like a child almost with a graze or a cut uh, going straight to their parent for comfort and care. Uh, Hannah goes straight to her heavenly father. To whom else could she go? Where else could she turn? There's no one and nowhere else but the Lord, the Lord of hosts. She comes and she holds nothing back. And do notice that about her prayer. She holds nothing back. Verse 10. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And listen to how she describes the prayer. Verse 15. I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. 
So there's passion here, isn't there? Hannah's prayer life is real. It's raw. It's intimate. It's honest. It's refreshingly so. There's no sense of duty for Hannah. Uh, There's no sense of prayer being a box-ticking exercise that needs to be done as part of her daily devotions. There's nothing dry or formal or stuffy about this. She, She pours out her soul to the Lord who knows her, the Lord who cares for her. And the sense you get from the passage is that She becomes so fully absorbed in all of this that she almost forgets herself. That she doesn't even realize Eli is watching on. That this prayer just consumes her. And in her bitterness of soul with tears, she pours out her anguish before the Lord. And you know something, friends? The God of 1 Samuel is a God who allows you to do that. The God of the Bible is a God who allows you to pour out your soul, to pour out your griefs, to pour out your troubles at his feet. He's okay with your tears. Some people get very awkward with tears. They get very uncomfortable with tears. Not the Lord. Not the Lord. They don't make him nervous in the slightest. He isn't uncomfortable with your tears. Uh, Psalm 56 tells us, You know about my troubled thoughts. For you their number took. Into your bottle put my tears. Are they not in your book? He has a record, you see, of our tears. Prayer isn't a technique then that we need to master. It's not an art form. Uh, Prayer isn't a matter of having a certain way with words. Hannah would even say prayer doesn't always even need to be vocalized aloud. It seems that at some point, certainly Hannah never said a word, but prayed inwardly. It's a pouring out of the soul onto the Lord. And surely, friends, one of the reasons our prayer lives are so weak, so shallow, and sometimes so non-existent, is because we don't really feel we need to pray. We sometimes think we can manage on our own without the Lord. And if we pray, it's because it's a duty-bound thing. But there's none of that here for Hannah. This is the cry of a child to their heavenly father. That's how Jesus illustrated prayer, wasn't it? Like a child asking their father for help. Tim Chester draws this out in his helpful commentary. Uh, How do little children ask their parent for help, he asks. Not usually in a calm, quiet, and measured way. Usually children insist. Usually they persist. Usually they clamor for your attention. It's an instinctive thing for a child to cry out to their parent. It's it's like an automatic reflex because they know, you see, help will come. And tragically, uh, this is a tragic thing that there's children in our care system in these days who've been neglected to the point where they've stopped crying out. They don't cry out for help anymore. Uh, And there are orphanages around the world where there's an eerie silence Over the beds, Uh, children who have suffered neglect will eventually just give up crying for help anymore. So you see, the cry of a child is is a cry of faith. It, It reflects their belief that there's someone there who will hear them and respond to them. And that's 
The point that Tim Chester makes about prayer, uh, the cry of prayer is the cry of faith. It arises from the belief that God is our Father and that he's able and willing to answer. And we pray because we know he cares. And we pray because we know he's able to step in. And some of us this evening, we know all too well this kind of prayer. This kind of pouring out of the soul. But there are others of us, I suspect, and we know very little of this kind of prayer. And our prayer lives are stinted, and they're stale, and they're starchy. And so so look at the sense of freedom that Hannah has in prayer. You and I can have this same sense of freedom. Uh, We can be open. We can be honest in prayer. We can be fragile. We can be vulnerable before the Lord. Uh, We don't need to pretend to be someone else. Uh, We can come with confidence to the throne of grace, seeking grace to help in our time of need. Consider then the true freedom of prayer. The freedom of prayer. Secondly then, the tangible comfort of prayer. The tangible comfort of prayer. Verses 17 to 20. Well, we we feel for Hannah in in what happens next, don't we? Uh, Someone is watching her pray. Uh, There is, you could say, a priestly peeping Tom. His name is Eli. He sees her lips moving and he takes her to be a drunk the way she's praying. And instead of offering help, comfort, support, Eli issues a stinging rebuke. Put your wine away. And Hannah has to defend herself. No, my Lord, I am not drunk. I've been pouring out my heart. My soul before the Lord. And to his credit, Eli recognizes she's been telling the truth. He pronounces a priestly blessing in her. Go in peace, verse 17. May the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. And Hannah goes. She leaves. She departs. But notice, friends, how she departs. Notice how she leaves the tabernacle, a changed woman. How she leaves the place of prayer, totally transformed. Totally transformed. Uh, This woman who hasn't been eating, uh, she's been weeping and bitterly pouring out her soul. Verse 18, the end of the verse. She went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. Now, Hannah has no idea yet as to how God will answer her prayer. She's been given no guarantees. And yet she leaves the place of prayer, her spirit lifted. And so often that happens in prayer, friends. So often, before prayer changes anything or anyone else, a part of God's purposes in prayer is for it to change us. To change us. Uh, when we come to him in prayer, pouring out our hearts before him, often we are the ones changed the most. Simply by spending time communing with him, spending time in his presence. Here's Hannah. She's poured out her soul, poured out her troubles. And she's learned to leave her troubles with him. She pours them all out and she leaves them with him. She's a model, really, Hannah. A model of Philippians 4, 6 and 7. You know it. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hannah's done that. She's presented her request to the Lord. And having done so, she knows the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. You could say she's a model of Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast now your cares upon the Lord, for he will use a stain. Or 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. I shared this story with someone recently, uh, this story of a missionary in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, who was driving his pickup in the bush one day when he met an, a, a, an older woman uh, who was carrying a huge bundle of firewood on her head. It was clearly very heavy. And so the missionary uh, stopped the truck and asked if she would like a lift. And so she climbed into the back and he started driving off and he turned around after a little while and was slightly bemused uh, when he saw that though she was sitting in the back of the truck, uh, the bundle of firewood was still on her head, uh, still on her head. And isn't that so often a picture of us? The missionary drew this out. He said, isn't that what we're like in prayer? It's almost as if for some reason we don't want to cast our burden upon the Lord. And we come to him and we're carried along by him. And yet we don't cast the burden upon him. One poem puts it, just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Often our struggle is in the leaving it there, isn't it? Hannah shows us something of the comfort that can be found in prayer. Even before God answers her. But then look at how he wonderfully answers. The comfort that comes in the answered prayer. Uh, verses 19 and 20. Uh, describe it in such an understated way. They went home. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife. And the Lord remembered her. Now, that's not to say the Lord had ever forgotten her. Uh, this is the remembering of his covenant mercy. It's the remembering of fulfilled promise. The Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, saying, I have asked for him from the Lord. Hannah has asked, and the Lord has given. The one who closed her womb is the one who now opens her womb. And he wonderfully answers her prayer. And she has a boy and she names him Samuel. Now we've got to be careful. This is no proof text uh, that every childless woman who prays for a child will receive one. Uh, this is no blank check proof text. God does not always give us exactly what we ask for, exactly when we ask for it. No doubt there were other barren women in Israel in those days who prayed to the Lord and they did not receive a child. And that isn't the point here. And we're going to see Hannah's story points to something much bigger, much more extraordinary than that. But surely, friends, at the very least we can see Prayer is not pointless. Prayer is not a futile exercise. A prayer rather is God's ordained means for the bringing about of his purposes. 
And that's a wonderful thing. An exciting thing. And if your life is barren in one way or another, by all means, pray about it. Pray about it. Ask others to pray about it. Whatever your burden, whether it's childlessness or something else, something which casts a long shadow over your life, by all means, pour out your soul to the sovereign Lord about it. Not only will he guard your heart and soul in perfect peace, but he just may well meet the desires of your heart, the tangible comfort of prayer. The tangible comfort. And thirdly, let's look at the total devotion of prayer. The total devotion. Uh, this is verses 21 to 28. And we'll just briefly consider Hannah's example here. Uh, she made a vow, a, a promise to the Lord back in verse 11. Verse 11 reads, Hannah vowed a vow. Lord, if you will indeed give me a son, then I will give him to you all the days of his life. Now, this wasn't an attempt to bribe the Lord. Uh, Hannah knows better than that. She's not twisting his arm in any shape or fashion. Rather, it is an expression of her total devotion. Her utter commitment. Give me a son, Lord. And I'll give him back to you. And we see verses 21 to 28. She's absolutely true to her word. Uh, once the boy is weaned. Which in that culture uh, might be a period of two to three years. Uh, she takes him to Shiloh. So, so she takes her toddler Samuel to Shiloh. And she gives little Samuel up to the Lord for the rest of his life. Verse 27, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. And that word lent in our Bibles has a far more permanent idea than ours. Uh, it has the sense of totally giving, of totally uh, dedicating over. We're not told very much about her emotional state in all of this. Surely we can have half an idea. I mean, some of you mums, uh, some of you mums can hardly drop your children to play school or nursery for a few hours without shedding a tear. Uh, can you imagine uh, giving them up for the rest of their lives? Such was Hannah's sacrificial devotion and dedication. And Elkanah's. Don't write him off. He's, he's involved here too. I just wonder, as a little aside, is there not a word of application to parents this evening? What do we know of this kind of devotion? This kind of dedication? God doesn't give the gift of children for us to hoard them and to keep them and to hold on tightly to them. Rather, we're to give them back, to give them back to the God who gave them to us. After all, who can take better care of our children than him? We need to entrust our children to his care, his will, whatever that might be. Like Hannah, devoting our children to the Lord. It'll mean all sorts of things. It'll mean praying with them. It'll mean reading his word with them. It'll mean bringing them to church. Setting them a godly example. It'll mean in time offering and sending them to serve the Lord in whatever capacity he sees fit. Remembering all the while that psalm we sang this morning, 127, how it describes our children as arrows. Arrows, the very picture. Arrows are, are meant to be sent. And sometimes we, uh, we send the arrows and they land very near. 
close to home, but sometimes we send them and God takes them to other countries, other continents, other time zones. I think many of us this evening, we'd be fine with the words, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. But it's something else to say, take my daughters, take my sons, in them both thy will be done. Our most precious possessions in all the world gladly being given back to the Lord. And let's not forget, he is a Lord who so loved the world that he gave and he sent his dearly beloved son into the world. Uh, So far be it from us to think our Christian duty is to live our life with our children untouchably at the center of our lives. Anna shows us what it is to have God at the center. Uh, Being willing to hand our children, grandchildren over to the Lord for him to use as however he pleases. The total devotion in prayer. The total devotion in prayer. But then, fourthly, the transforming power of prayer. The true freedom, the tangible comfort, the total devotion, and then the transforming power of prayer. And this is chapter 2, 1 to 10. Uh, This is what some people call Hannah's song uh, or even Hannah's psalm. And yet we're never told she sang these words. Rather, verse 1 says, She prayed and said. She prayed and said. Of course, much of the language is similar to the Psalms. There's poetry here. But this is still a window into her prayer life. But it's a different type of prayer than before. Uh, Earlier, she was pouring out her soul with tears. Uh, This is more a a bubbling up of the soul with thanksgiving. Verse 1. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn, uh, that is, my my strength is exalted in the Lord. How the tables have turned. Instead of barren emptiness, Hannah speaks of Joyous fullness. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. And she keeps coming back again and again in these verses to the same theme that the Lord, the sovereign God, is able to completely reverse circumstances. He's able to transform circumstances. He can turn things upside down. Uh, This is a prayer that is full of great reversals. Uh, Just a little overview. Verse 1, or verse 4, sorry, verse 4. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Verse 5. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. All these reversals. Verse 8. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. The transforming power of prayer. And in some ways, it's a bit of a strange prayer for a new mum to pray. Uh, New mums might say some strange things. This is a strange prayer. It it seems a bit over the top for someone who's just had a baby. But there are bigger things at play here. Hannah's speaking of things that are much, much bigger than her immediate circumstances. Ultimately, her prayer speaks of God's purposes for Israel, uh, for the church, Ultimately for the world. Because what God did for Hannah is is a small picture of what he can do on a much larger scale. I think of Israel in these days. Israel, like Hannah, was barren. 
fruitless, spiritually speaking. But God can bring life where there is no life. He can bring an end to Israel's barrenness, and he will bring an end to her barrenness. Is there not a picture of the church today in all of this as well? In much of the Western world today, the church appears pretty barren. Uh, We're seeing little visible fruit. Few children, you might say, in terms of new converts. Little signs of new spiritual life. Some, certainly, but not in great significant numbers. Wouldn't we here love to see a greater impact in our local community, to see souls saved, peoples won for the Lord Jesus? And like Hannah, the the church here in the West today is on the receiving end of mockery, abuse, scorn. And so there's something to learn from our prayer. Our God is a God of great reversals. And there's power in prayer. A transforming power. Surely as a church today, we would do well to follow Hannah. uh, To pour out our soul collectively to the sovereign Lord in prayer. That he might give spiritual children, converts, changes. For almost a year now, every other month, uh, we've been praying on Friday mornings for exactly this. That the Lord would convert and save the lost. About 12 to 14 of us each Friday morning, every other month, praying that the Lord would open up the windows of heaven and end our seeming barrenness. And if you're free to join, it would be great to see you. Zoom, Friday mornings. If you can't join us, pray yourself to this end. And be encouraged. By Hannah's prayer. The transforming power of prayer. We see her at the end. Verses 9 and 10. Prophetically looking ahead. To the coming day of separation. uh, When the faithful will be guarded. But the wicked will be cut off. When the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. She even mentions A future king. Now that's remarkable. Remarkable. There was no king in those days. But led by the Spirit, Hannah speaks of a future anointed king. Literally the word for anointed at the very end of the prayer is the word Messiah. It's a prayer about the coming Lord Jesus Christ. What a prayer this is. And it just might be as you consider this final part of her prayer in chapter 2. It maybe makes you think of another prayer in the Bible. Another prayer from another obscure, burdened woman. Mary's prayer from Luke chapter 1. We actually thought of it in our December series. Sometimes called Mary's Magnificat. And though Mary was praying centuries after Hannah, she was certainly familiar with Hannah's prayer. Much of the language is similar. But instead of Mary's prayer being about a future king, hers was about her own miracle baby, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, King of Kings. So here in 1 Samuel Hannah, she could hardly have imagined the immense reach of the things she was praying for. And God is able to do far more than she could ask or even imagine. She could only glimpse a little of God's salvation in her life. But it was just a little Of a far greater work that God was doing. God really is doing far more in our lives. Than we can really comprehend. So she teaches us this evening. About the freedom of prayer. 
the comfort of prayer, the devotion of prayer, and the power of prayer.